Well, hello everybody out there in Manchester, Hooks Auburn. This is the progress report for this uh, Wednesday, August 15th. Yeah, that's right, folks. We're halfway through the month the of August. The Ides of August. Beware the Ides of August. No Which means we're three that. quarters of the way through the <laughs> summer. Think about that, folks, as you're probably getting ready to get your kids back to school. And we're going to take a break from the uh, discussions we've been having with candidates for office, particularly for the 1st Congressional District here in New Hampshire. I think we've got most of them covered. The only one that hasn't showed up yet is Maura Sullivan, and I do have a request into her, her campaign for her to appear, but I have not heard back. I may have some things to say about that at another time, but I'm not going to bother with that right now. But we are going to have an exceptionally interesting show, I think, today. We have a Christian Palestinian with us from the West Bank, uh, a town not far from uh, Jerusalem. And uh, he is a person who is uh, very committed to the peace process, to nonviolence, and to education. His name is Malad. And I'm not going to even attempt to pronounce his last name. You want to pronounce it for me? Voskarjian. Yeah, Voskarjian. Yeah, there he is. Good job, Bob. <laughs> Very brave of you to try. Nice I only, work. Nice I, only, work. I only had to hear it once, but I'm not, I may not try it again. But as we often do, we're going to start off with my good friend Mike Farley, who's here with me. And by the way, I'm very sorry not to be with you uh, last week or the week before. Thank you, Lou, for hosting that when I was not feeling well. But Mike is here, and he's got another POTUS report and the progress report. It's going to be quick, and then we'll get into our discussion. Yep, this one I, I can guarantee is going to be quick because I'm going to bring a video, folks. So go get get some popcorn, sit back. Uh, I got a little two-minute video. Um, we have a very serious topic on deck here uh, today. I don't want to detract from that, but uh, there's just been so much going on coming out of the White House uh, over the past couple of weeks that we haven't been here that I thought it was just time to take a little break, um, maybe uh, catch a little bit of amusement. And um, so uh, we'll uh, cue up this video. Hope you like it, and we'll uh, get back to the serious topics next week. I've traveled the world to learn I must return from Russia with love. I've seen places, faces, and smiled for a moment. But oh, you haunted me so Still my tongue-tied Young pride would not let my love for you show In case you'd say no To Russia I flew But there and then I suddenly knew You'd care again By running around It's through to you from Russia with Well, you know, my, my tongue is planted firmly in my cheek with that one. I, I'm just, you know, just looking for that. I think no, no commentary is required. You know, that, that was fun. You know, a little, a little, uh, what, do you, what do you call it? A little cotton candy. You know what I mean? No nutritional value there, but uh, a little fun. Okay. Well, there, there's our entertainment and our POTUS report for this, uh, this, uh, this edition of the Progress Report. You came through again, Mike. And now I want to turn it over to Malad and... Uh, Malad, uh, you've been so active and done so much uh, uh, to deal with the 
terrible situation you feel you, you, you face being in an occupied land. But I'd like you to tell us, if, you, if, you, if you're willing to do it, tell us a little bit about yourself, how you came to be doing the work you're doing, and then tell us about the work you're doing and, uh, and its importance. Yeah. Uh, I came from Armenian-Palestinian family. I was born as an uh, Armenian Catholic, growing up in the Jewish, Armenian, and Muslim, and Christian quarters in the old city. I was in the Armenian school because my roots. You were then born in, in Jerusalem? I was born in Jerusalem, definitely. Uh, then I, my father took me to the Arab-Palestinian Protestant Lutheran school. Then I moved uh, to many schools. So. Um, during my life, uh, one day I felt that there is something strange, you know. I saw an, an army uh, checkpoint stop, stopping me and telling me where you are going. Uh, I told them that I'm Palestinian Christian, I'm going to my community, the Armenian Palestinian community in the old city. He told me where you are from told him I'm from Jerusalem. I was born in Jerusalem. He told me, go home. So that fear and that doubts of my identity, who are they? I grew up in a very musical family, very liberal, uh, democratic family. Uh, we believe in arts and music. And we never ever talked about politics. I never remember my parents tell me that we need to hate the Jews, we need to hate the Muslims, we are Christians, because we've grown in the Palestinian communities where coexistence is a model of life. So, after... So, so when, when you were told to go home, wasn't Jerusalem your home? Uh, my grandparents, they bought a land in Bethany. Bethany, where Jesus came and met his dear friend Lazarus. And when he came... He resurrected him from the death. So Christians also believe that they need to be where Jesus stepped, walked, prayed, cried, do miracles. So Bethany, it's very close. It's considered now suburbs of Jerusalem. But after 2003, Israel government decided to do a separation wall that separates all the Palestinian villages and towns from Jerusalem. So they don't want, they want to work on the demography that Arabs are be will be the minority in the Israel state. And Palestinians will be r just in the West Bank. No freedom of movement. Everywhere are checkpoints. And with that separation wall, it killed all Palestinian life. Can we explore that a little bit? Because I, I want to make sure I'm understanding. You, you, you came from a community in, in which the different factions, let's call them, um, yeah. Christians, Jews, Palestinians, um, Armenians, Arabs, you, you know, we're, we're kind of living side by each. And then when you you see a policy change and Israel comes in and builds this physical wall, and that causes people to kind of separate. It, you, if it, they find themselves on what they might consider the wrong side of the wall, more yeah. more of the people they identify with are on the other side. So people, it kind of tears neighborhoods apart. Yeah. And they and and then you end up with the result that I guess was intended, you have one, you know, one group on one side and one group on the other. Is that yeah. how this worked or am I misunderstanding? Yeah, uh, this, this is like a strategy of divide and rule. Uh, this wall also it divided families, uh, it divided cities, Palestinian cities. So we called it a snake or a cancer that it killed even the life. So if I gonna reach at before the wall, Jerusalem, it, it used to take me just five minutes. Now, with that wall, each village, Palestinian village, they have a terminal, a very security terminal that Palestinians are not allowed to go freely to Jerusalem. They need to go if you have permit or if you ask permit. And 80% of the Palestinian communities, they are not allowed to be in Israel state. They have to be just in the West Bank people. But with that wall, it also killed the economic freedom of movement. It become worse and restricted. So each town, each village, we have 24 hours a checkpoint, and you cannot have your own freedom. So life become worse. Everything become so more controlled. So, so you have to line up at, at a gate, at a checkpoint. With a checkpoint, because I used to work in Jerusalem as a waiter, so I can give food to my family, because also 
House of Hope at that time, we didn't have much projects, we didn't have much fundraising, we didn't have much people that working with us. So I need to wake up at 4 a.m., waiting until 6, until the checkpoint or the terminal will open. Why I used to go at 4? Because Palestinians workers have to line up, so you have each minute 10 or 20. So th that also a big and a huge it's struggle. It's a choke point. It's really a huge humu humiliating, dehumanizing people. I felt insecure. I felt really um, in a, w a new path of slavery. You, kn yeah. you know. Well, you know, the Israelis would say, Malad, that yeah, they, they they have to know that checkpoints are brutal and dehuman, uh, dehumanizing and uh, and uh, stressful. All of those things, but they would say we had to do something to protect ourselves. We were having terrorist attacks in Jerusalem, yeah. the Jewish uh, part of the city was enduring bombings, a, a pizza shop, you know, all these things. And they say, what choice did we have? We had to put up this wall to protect ourselves from the people who, were, unlike you, were not committed to peaceful means but to violent means. Well, what's your response to that? My response to that, I have a simple story that happens with me, you know. Uh, we never justify, uh, you know, when you are afraid, you, ne you never ju justify violence against. So I don't believe that uh, one violent mistake or one crazy one that he do anything against a citizen of Israel that we need to punish the whole generation. We are talking about one million and a half in Gaza. They are almost 30 or 40 years. They cannot come to the West Bank. They don't have any kind of freedom. West Bank, we have around 3 million Palestinians that they are restricted of movement. Also, their houses are demolished. Their land is confiscated. So my mom, I lost my mom with cancer in 2008. I was not allowed to meet my own mom. She was five minutes away. Can any Israeli child bear that pain that he cannot go and visit. Mm -hmm. I don't think that Palestinian ever from oppressed to be the oppressor. And I cannot see the image of the Israelites from the Bible, from what happened to them in the Holocaust, the Jews in the world, and what's going on with Palestinians. We shouldn't pay that cost of their fear and doubts that Palestinians one day they will kill. No, we cannot justify that regime on Palestinians. Our kids deserve better life as any kids in the world. If we are all different, but we are all equal. So do you so think the Israelis could protect their people from violent attacks by means other than this wall and the checkpoints? Is there another way to do it? I understand it works out very unfairly for yeah. people like you. You're a peaceful man. You believe in nonviolence. You're a Christian. You believe in the, you know, the power of love. Uh, so, but do, do the Israelis have an alternative that you think they should use to, uh, to, to make themselves safe and not inflict these indignities on you and people like you? I believe that Jews in the U.S., when the civil rights movement started with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Jews were supporters. Mm -hmm. Yes, they and were. And the civil rights movement for any equality. I was in the Blue Star camp before two weeks with Palestinians and Israelis. The owners of the Blue Star camp were Jew family. And imagine they, the only camp that can accept people in color were that camp. And we know the segregation and we know everything, but I don't believe, you know, dehumanizing people will bring peace to Israel. Mm -hmm. I don't believe Violence can defeat violence. Only light can defeat darkness. So if we are talking about beloved community, we're no judgment of color, we're no judgment of identity, we're no judgment of ethnic backgrounds. Why the Palestinian nation till now, they don't have their freedom. They don't have their dignity. When Martin Luther King went to, to, any, to, to a motel, he refused to get out from that motel. And the owner of that motel or hotel, he came to Martin Luther King and he asked him, what do you want? He said, my dignity. So if you are asking me, what do we want as a nation? 
we want our dignity. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you know, you talk about light defeating darkness, and uh, I, we're going to turn the topic uh, as we get through the show to um, your project, the House of Hope, yeah. which I think certainly sounds like, uh, and you're going to tell us more about it. Sounds like. Um, a, a ray of light in, 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 in what otherwise could be seen as a dark situation. Yeah. And uh, tell us a little bit about that. Uh, what, you know, you know what, uh, what got you started? You, you, you've talked about, you know, you, you, you found yourself at that checkpoint. You found yourself in a situation that you couldn't even go, you know, you were told to go home. Yeah. Something, in, instead of being resentful, instead of turning to violence, you took another path. You talked a little bit about how your family was interested in music. I think that may have been uh, instrumental in this. Tell, tell us a little bit about how you thought it was, your outlet was, was to, yeah. to start a school. Uh, my second new birth was when I was 16 years old. Uh, I was so inspired by Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And even though when he went to Jerusalem, that was a really life transformation transformation for me how he, when he walked on the via dolorosa he can bear the pain for people so i came to a certain moment when i lost my mom i said no i will go second day to that checkpoint and i will wish that soldier or that girl that she is oppressing me i will tell her yom tov which is i wish you a good day and i will smile and that change my life but when my mom struggled with cancer I was new graduate I studied hotel management and the life in the West Bank was crazy no work siege tanks second intifada so I came with the idea that I don't want to be a slave in my own country so I convinced my brother that the only way that we gonna get off slavery system or we're gonna be free is by educating our community and transforming them through reconciliation nonviolence is only way through music and arts and we were serving the Muslim communities at the beginning they were afraid because who are they the Christians will the Palestinian Christians will change our traditions change change you know music in some conservative communities are taboo mm -hmm. so no, we said we're going to continue, and it was a life transforming to our committee to see how much the image of God are so powerful. When you see woman in hijab, she has a guitar. <laughs> Honestly, to see boys and girls hand by hand dancing dabka, that's our identity. So... Day by day, we were so strong, and we sent people to South Africa, to Sweden. We were in the U.S., so we believe that Palestinian youngs, they should be equipped with art. The only weapon can defeat hate is when you are artist, when you are musician, when you are writer, when you are author. So we want to be also Hollywood stars, but in our <laughs> way. <laughs> we want to be heroes also in our way without guns without okay. bombs you know okay well i guess it's time start. for our first break and we'll come back with milan and talk about uh, what he's been doing to try and make this vision he's been talking about become a reality for not only him but uh, others in the uh, area in which he lives as a uh, christian palestinian he's part of a small minority in the west bank so that must have presented some challenges. We'll come back and talk about that. And by the way, folks, we'd love to have any of you that are interested in the subject, and I hope some of you are, call in 640-3091 is, of course, our phone number. We'd be glad to take calls about this issue and about the whole issue of, uh, you know, the uh, Palestinian uh, role in, uh, in the West Bank and Gaza Strip and the Israelis' uh, concern for security and uh, whether they are uh, d protecting their security in a way that's uh, that's the best for not only their citizens but the neighbors where they have many many settlements now amongst the uh, Palestinians living in the West Bank many many settlements uh, a couple hundred thousand at least isn't it Milad, that they have they have uh, now one million one million one million in one the million. West Bank well there's so. a shared land for sure 
And so we'll talk about all of this when we come right back. We'll be right back with you in just a, just a moment or two. So this is the progress report for this Wednesday in the middle of August, August 15th, and uh, we're very glad to welcome from Palestine, uh, Malad, who's a uh, Christian Palestinian, and he's been telling us about some of the uh, costs of living in a, in a land that's under occupation with a security fence and checkpoints and all the humiliation that that involves. But uh, Malad is doing some things that I think uh, trying to bring a positive uh, positive difference to the to the people there and uh, he's got a video in this I just ask you uh, tell us a little about the video and then we'll show it to the audience uh, this video it shows the daily life how the Palestinian uh, kids from the suburbs because we serve now three villages they are <coughs> inside the West Bank <coughs> so we have a school uh, because we believed when you open a school you will close a prison and we don't want also our kids to be involved in drugs <coughs> and crimes mm -hmm. in the community. So what specialized our school is that we integrate on daily basis a nonviolent prayer quoted by St. Francis Assisi. Uh, and also we talk about the Abrahamic, the sons of Abraham. We talk about the three religions because very important for our kids when we talk about Judaism not to mix with Zionism, with extremism. When we talk about Islam, we know at least there's no stereotypes and judgment. And when we talk about Christianity, they will understand as Muslim community how to respect the differences and the values. And also now we are integrating, we, you will see also the world of education. Part of, of it, it's about imagination and how we integrate environment, care, and throwing seeds and connecting with land I and identity. So you will see in that film a short life of House of Hope. Okay. Music, arts, and school education. So we'll go right to that now. It's only a little bit more than four minutes, folks, and then we'll be right back with more discussion. The Isaiah is a place surrounded by walls, surrounded by fear. Uh, no hope. From the western side, the nine kilometer uh, concrete wall, and then later on, we have the north security wall on the eastern side we have the uh, the wall which is completed isolated in Isaiah from the center of Jerusalem we don't have any resources when you live in the West Bank it's not predictable we can move freely we can be ourselves. That makes uh, lots of traumas for kids. Uh, they see uh, frustration in the eyes of their families. Uh, they uh, see uh, violence. In 2008, I saw our kids uh, going through 
really a hard time, especially spending time in the streets. I founded House of Hope because these kids deserve a place where it adapts all their dreams and hobbies, talents. With occupation, people don't look to arts and music as priority. As a non-government organization, grassroots level, our role is to try to support also the government, schools and families. Music and arts are so important. It gives them a space to take out all their anger, uh, their depression, their sadness. Also, it gives them a goal. As we go towards uh, collective work and action, towards change and uh, freedom, the most important thing is to begin with the childhood education. Childhood education is a method of non-violence. House of Hope is the first school in the West Bank to be inspired from Waldorf education methods. Our students take oath as a children in Palestine to be non-violent towards their neighbor, towards themselves, and towards anyone that is foreigner, plus to the Israelis. They start the day with a non-violent prayer. It's quoted from St. Francis. Martin Luther King, Shohaka, and Wihdi. We learn about Martin Luther King, uh, Gandhi, Abdul Ghaffar Khan. Hey. These people, they taught uh, governments uh, how to be human. We believe that there will be a time for our uh, uh, justice and for our freedom. We believe in hope. We believe in peace. We never give up. Malad brought for us, you may have seen him in it. The uh, lady you saw in that video is his wife. There's also a brief clip of his son, who I guess attends the school. Uh, yeah, very nice. And he's quite a dancer. <laughs> he's quite a dancer. So the school is committed to uh, teaching nonviolence, is that right? Yeah. And the school it, it deals with children. I don't know if this includes your own son, but a lot of these children have been traumatized by the violence of the conflict, is that right? Yeah. Tell us about that. I mean, uh, what sort of trauma have they got and how does the school help them? Uh? Yeah. Of course, for, on daily life, we have military everywhere. And sometimes you can go to shopping and suddenly you find Israel jeep throwing gas, tear gas. They don't care, mm -hmm. you know. In my house, exactly, it's like between the wall, two meters from the wall. And if, you know, normally the, the Israeli soldiers, they feel bored, so they want to play Tom and Jerry with, the, with our Palestinian kids, or our Palestinian kids, they feel bored. So also, you know, on daily life, we see like there is a killing, assassination for young, arrest <laughs> of young. And of course, normally the army come at 2 a.m., 1 a.m., 3, they knock the door or they, whatever, and they terrify everyone. So kids, it's also, Gaza war also, made a bad impressed um, feelings it, it it brings much fear to our kids so my son i remember when we went to a palestinian hospital in hebron he saw our palestinian police were like the israeli and he was terrified he ran away to me he didn't know that they are palestinian police as you know we have some cities owned by the pna palestinian national authority controls so this school it helps their fear, trauma, and doubts. 
because also as you see you see it to their faces it's really to find a smile and as you know the Palestinian from oppression we have much violence also in our families high percentage of divorce we have high percentage of violence between families of course abuse against kids kids labor in our communities so what we accept and closure imagine the 120,000 inhabitant 70 percent of them they are kids when we are talking about kids we are talking about let's say from 2 to 16 they don't have playground so what they see in daily life so this through music through education through arts through drama therapy because we believe music and in drama therapy plus to that space holy space that we give them to meditate and to listen to what great people like Gandhi the values of Gandhi the values of Jesus when he said love your enemy imagine you tell that to a Muslim child it's not about submission it's not about giving up to occupation and to the oppressor it's a time to think about forgiveness and about reconciliation so we can really fight in a non-violent way the unjust in the Israeli society and Israeli system and and you've been doing this since 2008 so you you've got 10 years of daily work with these kids and a consistency that might be um, welcome they, they 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 might welcome this where they they can always go there and it's always going to be safe it's always going to be welcoming to them whereas there's a little bit more chaos outside the yeah. walls of your school house of hope now it's the only place where kids can come just <coughs> not for school we have summers schools we have people from abroad that they come that they bring their knowledge their experience to us some people they come and they do festivals so why mm -hmm. like i'm trying to share my voice because we want that solidarity we don't want to feel alone we don't want to feel neglected you know we want people to hear our voice and to act now we want that support of people to the house of hope and your students are both christian and i guess most of them are muslim right now uh, we had 10 families but not anymore because they are grown up and of course according to the israel law the Palestinian kids who has Israeli residency or citizenship, they are not allowed in, to be in Palestinian or in the West Bank or in Palestinian schools. They need to be either in Israel, in Arab communities or Palestinian schools, but they need to be in Israel. So if they don't prove, they will lose their health insurance. They will lose their rights in being in Israel state. And we want our people to be in Israel state. <coughs> we want their voice of justice to be there also. So we don't want people to... So you're, you're drawing from the universe of kids outside yeah. of Israel. Because you, you want the ones that are there to, to keep the benefits that they do have to, to, to stay in that education system so that they can, um, I mean, as citizens of Israel, they have rights as citizens of Israel. Yeah. They can vote. They, yeah. they, they can run for office. They, yes. can, they, can be, they, they can represent your interests within the Knesset. But as if, you know, the, the, Arab, something the Palestinian <laughs> Arab communities in Israel, they don't have full rights. Mm -hmm. They don't have full services. Okay, you can reach to a certain, you can reach to the Knesset. We have five members, but they don't talk about our voice. But mm -hmm. some, the, 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 the new ones, they talk about the Palestinian voice now because they cannot divide. In Israel, you say Arab Israelis, but we say Palestinians who live in the state of Israel. Mm -hmm. So... And of course, why we are doing that education, because we believe the Palestinian education also is not well done. Because in the government school, they don't offer arts and music. They don't offer a way that there is no judgment for kids. So we have much violence in our schools too. So we believe that House of Hope, it will be in the future a chain of schools in the West Bank and in the, in the Palestinian state. You know, for... <coughs> Americans who uh, haven't been there and had a chance to meet people like you, their image of Palestinian youth is somebody throwing stones at a yeah. checkpoint or at the wall or at Israeli soldiers and then, you know, being injured by rubber bullets or sometimes live ammunition. And, uh, and uh, that's, a, that's a horrible image uh, that we have of, of the Palestinian youth. 
uh, but you're offering a different image of Palestinian I mean, youth. I represent the Palestinian youth, you know, with my tattoo. Uh, I'm the way through some life, you know. Mm -hmm. Everyone has his freedom. In, in we are the Palestinian image in the West with the bad media, unfortunately. You know, Palestinians, you can see many, hundreds and thousands. Mm -hmm. And some people, they choose to go demonstrations. But of course, the snipers, will, will th they don't have mercy. So, but we have many singers. We have many professional dancers. And why I am here? Because <coughs> I want each, car, each child, even if he was handicapped, he has a voice, he has his hands, he has a power in himself, he has an image of God that he can talk and share. So our kids are very powerful and creative kids. We have a caller. Well, we're fortunate on line two. I guess that's this one. Hello. Hello, Carolyn. You're yeah. live on the Progress Report. Yeah, I have a question for Malad. Sure. Excellent. Go ahead. Go ahead. There's a delay, Carolyn. You may want to turn your TV down. Sometimes that can get confusing. Okay. Um, I'm wondering if he has any insight as to why so few U.S. Christians seem to support Palestinians. Rather, they seem to be allied with Zionist Jews. Mm. That's a fantastic uh, you know, I'm question. I'm about that myself here in the United States. It seems like the best support for Palestinians here in the United States are actually Jews who are not Zionists. So I don't know if he would have any insight about that. Okay. Thanks for the call, Carolyn. That's Thank you for that question. I think an insightful question. What do you think? Uh, uh, during my experience with Americans, um, I feel real actions comes from American Jews towards Palestinians. Uh, unfortunately, till now, uh, I'm trying to build a big network, a big lobby, towards supporting House of Hope existence, because it, re it represents human rights issues and solving conflict and transformation. And I feel sad because the, ev the evangelical church in the U.S., you know, they never support, and I feel sad that during the 50 years, no one knew that there are, Palestine was 50 Muslims, 47% Christians, 3% Jews, and now we are the minorities. And advocating Palestinian Christians from the Middle East, it's a big mistake, because now the war will be religious. We are the light of the world, we are the salt of the world, and we seek justice. And I believe that the only change that comes to the Middle East and to Israel Palestine is through <coughs> Americans. White people should, wherever they are, evangelical, Democrats, wherever, conservative, they need to stand with justice. You know, I wish that Christians are there. And the commandment of Jesus, you know, don't leave Jerusalem. And unfortunately, everyone, immigration is open to the world. Christians are running away because there's no hope. It will be a Jew state. Mm -hmm. Where is our rights? Palestinians, Christians, we are not even minority. So I hope that my voice to any Christian in the state you can m make big steps towards justice. We are not now seeking peace. Peace doesn't come without justice, you know? So now- You need to put the foundation <laughs> first, you right? Know. If no one look to Palestinians as a nation, you know, we are not terrorists. So I hope one day when they read, you know, one thing I want to say, I remember I used to work in a hotel in Jerusalem because the only way is to, f to get money is to go to that checkpoint and run away at 4 a.m. under the rain and go to prepare the breakfast for internationals and Americans. And I used to see Americans opening the Bible and praying, and at the end of the day, pray, pray for Israel. And I just asked one American that his life was changed. And I won't mention his name because he became famous activist in the U.S. 
doing lobbying for justice and Palestinian and Mexicans. His name is John Hawkins. And I asked him, do you know that your brothers in Christ are persecuted in this land? Do you know that we don't have freedom of movement? Then he looked at me, and I have time to share about my experience with my mom and my the occupation. He went back home, and his life was transformed. And he came and he started leading the Global Immersion Project, bringing Christians from all churches, <coughs> black communities, reverends, pastors, preachers to Israel to hear the two stories and to go back to the US and to do a real change. So this is like a model of people that they were pro, pro Israel. I didn't know they were pro injustice, but they, when their eyes were open, we don't want people to be pro Palestine. We want people to be pro justice and to put a stop for that apartheid system that's going on in Israel or Palestine. Okay. Well, I guess it's time for our final break. I could yeah. use one. This is a pretty intense discussion, Very boss. intense discussion. And uh, I want to thank our callers. Oh, yeah. um, thank our caller and indeed. That was in, a invite question. folks to call in. Um, this is a. a uh, my eyes are being opened uh, as, as, as I sit here um, and you know I'm someone who tries to pay attention and I'm learning things that I was completely oblivious to I'm ashamed to say um, but uh, that's that's why we put the show on I think we'll be right back call in 6403091 we'll be right back Hey, folks, if you've been with us, you know that we're talking with Malad, uh, a Christian Palestinian who's visiting the United States, and he, with his wife, have uh, founded and continue to run a school where the curriculum includes a commitment to nonviolence, a lot about the arts, in an effort to uh, help kids heal from the trauma of the inherent violence of the occupation of the uh, Holy Land uh, between the Israelis and the Palestinians and the, the fences and the checkpoints and all that. And we're learning a lot. And uh, I understand we may have a caller in line too, do we? Let's uh, push the button and see. Hello? Hello, Hello. caller? Hello? Hello, is this uh, progress? It sure is. It is. It sure is. Sure is. You yeah. may want to turn your TV down a little bit. It's a, there's a delay, so it gets a little confusing. Oh, there's a delay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You all set? Go right ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I'm ready. Go right ahead. Yeah. What's your yeah. question? Okay. Um, I, I happen to be a veteran for peace, a real live veteran, and a veteran for peace. So I guess I'm kind of in sync with Malad there, but I do want to commend both you, Bob. And Mike, both of you, for bringing the other side of the story to Manchester. I think it's very, very important. And Bob, for you, I really hope, I'm glad that the session is not in right now, so your friend from the Connecticut River won't be back on your case again. <laughs> <laughs> I know who you're talking about. Yes, I do. <laughs> well, thanks for the call. <laughs> uh, yes, that's, uh, that's, uh, well, that's good. We, uh, we have some people that are interested here. Uh, Malad, that's really good. So, um, how are you feeling about the way things are going? I mean, you know, it's it's the, for an observer from afar, like I am. Although, as I told you, I was once in Jerusalem, but it was a long time ago. It's, it, it just seems so hopeless. It seems so grinding and horrible and, and ongoing without much signs of a, uh, a good resolution. And obviously, you're you're doing you you believe you know you, you you build a solution, one small piece at a time, and your school is one small piece to move forward. But you know, how are you feeling about 
the prospects in the Middle East and in Israel and Palestine in particular. And do you think we can overcome the cycle of violence? I think with the President Trump declaration that Jerusalem is the eternal capital for Israel, it makes the life more worse. Uh, uh, and I don't believe that the Israel government, the right wing, are willing. You know, they say always, you never give a Palestinian a pillow of leathers. So do you, do, you just keep him hungry and, you know, and he dreams, he dreams with a car or he dreams with a cheeseburger. So <laughs> uh, I don't believe that, you know, uh, hate it's in Israel become bigger because the right wing is controlling everything and people they feel scared uh, and there's no any more left wing and the Palestinian side we don't have also a leader we don't have a government so most of the parties are corrupted and we are talking about more than 30 years of negotiation mm -hmm. what we get or what we got more walls more dictator regime towards Palestinians more confiscating now, you know, we have young kids. We, we have in Jerusalem, in the old city, three years old kid, he has house detained. He can, he's not allowed. What do we expect from such... Hello? Hello? Oops. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. So, we have 9,000 or 11 or 10,000 prisoners. So, what, I don't know. I don't see, like, even a hope for a two-state solution. Mm -hmm. You know, I wish before I die, at least we have an airport. Mm -hmm. We have a dignity. You know, to come to the U.S., it took me three borders, no four. Mm -hmm. You know, f from West Bank to Jericho. Jericho, we have the Palestinian border, then the Israeli borders, then the Jordan borders. You know, I don't know. That's very if, tough. Uh, if, if in Bethlehem we don't have water, we take water just twice a month. Yeah, I've heard about that. That know, sounds like, that sounds know, like a brutal I moved thing. to Bethlehem. I was traumatized brutal, because brutal. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't take a shower. I couldn't believe that I am in the 21st century. We are 2018. That Palestinians, I don't know, they are not allowed to take showers or they don't have water. Their own water springs, we buy our water. So, I, you know, I believe... There's no hope in the coming 10 years. Yeah. Things will be worse and Palestinians are, you know, squeezing that hate, squeezing that anger, but till when, you know. Yeah, yeah. Wait, but wait. You're, you're not giving up hope. You say there's, there's no hope for the, for the each, bigger each, picture. Each, but time, each time I go to my bed and I cry and I feel hopeless, I, I don't want to continue that mission, you know. A good people from here, the world, I don't know, God is shown through people, you know, I have my sister, she's an American Jew, and she's been devoted for two years from her life to for House of Hope, so yeah. what, do I, what do I can expect from when I see that model from the American Jews, you know? And we really had a lot of talk about House of Hope and, and what it is and how people might uh, help this and what its goals are. Well, I did. I did want to mention before we we go at that uh, we we have this um, chart here, but you do have a Facebook page. Support we have. House we of are Hope. so active on uh, Facebook, on the social media, Instagram. That might be a way for so people, people to go and have look. We have friends about. in the U.S. We have a team from Christian and uh, Amer Americans. They work hard. We have now the charitable number i don't know what's five five oh one c three which yeah. um, many so people, people are can familiar donate with and tax deducted so we have bank account we have everything so even people can read through the social media so and i imagine your project house of hope depends entirely on charitable contributions it doesn't get any it doesn't we take, we take support. we take fee from palestinian kids but you know, when you take $500 and you have five kids or four kids and you have Israeli standards, they, they take 1500 the minimum, and we take, you know, I take 300 bucks a month, and I live in Israel, and the minimum should be 100, 1600 so, so I hope people will hear my voice and 
will do something because House of Hope, really. You know, each year I give the last year because we had the big grant from Japan. We had a mil one million dollar grant for four years from the government of Japan. Wow! So that was a big motivation that you we I recruited more than thirty employee with us from all kind professional dancers, wherever all kind of arts plus vocation training. It was plus vocation training. But in 2016, when the life become worse in the old city, so the life of one Japanese because. It was dangerous to come from West Jerusalem to East Jerusalem and to take a bus to Bethany, so they shut down. So 30 from that, from 2016 till now, we are struggling. So we don't have salaries, so the only way is through donations. But this year we are planning to start asking the USAID grant fund because now we are, you know, uh, as organization, as a House of Hope, legally registered in the U.S. government, so hopefully in a way we can find any solution. When, when your students, uh, you, you go through elementary school, right? Yeah. Kindergarten through elementary. When your students leave your school, are they able to go to another school for their further education that will have these same values and, 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 and support nonviolence in their lives? Uh, as I know, you know, I grew up in many schools in my life. I never had, I never knew about candy you know, or Dr. Martin Luther King. So I'm not sure that they will have that because in our curriculum, it's not like we don't have nonviolent or MVC because we plus we give nonviolent communication for Marshall Rosenberg. I do it with puppets. So I play with the kids, try to deal with feelings and needs and how we shouldn't judge, you know, others, whatever, your father, your mom, you know. So... One day, if a House of Hope school will be like till 12th grade, because our dream in the future is to build a really inspired school by King, Gandhi, and Abdul Ghaffar Khan. Let me ask you this. Um, do you ha are there any examples of, of kids that have gone through your program? They're a little older now. Have you been able to follow any kids to see? What kind of impact you're making on their lives? Do you do you have any? Yeah, you know, you know any former students that have come back and said, you know, thank you, uh, that kind of thing. At least when I walk in my community, I feel that I am a star, or I feel that you know, each one calls me because in our community we have the uh, the respect. So wherever I go, when I go to the bakery, to the wherever, each one I see my my, my kids now they are in higher education. Uh, some of them they they graduated from to be to do a filmmakers some of them now are artists you know they went to the field because also uh, we don't just talk about arts we see exactly and we try to talk with their families and if we had scholarships we could try to ask some friends to do fundraising for their education in art mm -hmm. school or music so yeah and one thing that uh, my kids, when now when they are grown up, when they see, they tell me, we wish to go back when we were with you. We wish to have I time. can imagine. So, so sounds like a dream school. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a dream because kids, you know, I don't know, we believe in, in the power of love. You know, it's not about structure. I never believe in structure. Well, so on that, we've got to close. But um, you certainly have painted a heck of a picture. And, and folks, go to Facebook, support House of Hope, or even on Instagram, House of Hope Palestine. You can get more information, and um, you can donate. Okay. Thank, thank you, you for joining thank us, you, Thank lot. you. It was very interesting, and it's uh, something I think people need to know about. A little ray of hope in a sea of uh, some gloomy news yeah. over there <laughs> in the Middle East. So that's great. Yeah. And we will be back next week, folks, with another edition of the Progress Report. Not quite ready to announce our program next week, but I've got some ideas. But we will be back Excellent. next week. See you next week, folks. Thank you.